Thank you, and uh, thank you very much also to the uh, Bar Association, especially the leadership, for this uh, honor of uh, speaking uh, to us all on the uh, state of the nation. Uh, regarding whether or not uh, we have succeeded, I think it's too early, uh, it's early days, uh, to say whether uh, we succeeded in turning uh, the pandemic into an opportunity. But, uh, but I must say that uh, the pandemic itself presents an opportunity. And we, uh, as a government, have seen it as such, as an opportunity to do so many different things. First of all, even just in scaling up our medical response and our, med and our capacity uh, to be able to respond to pandemics now or in the future. Uh, as you know, we used to have four uh, molecular laboratories. Now we have 64 uh, molecular laboratories. We have uh, now capacity uh, for far more uh, um, ICU beds. We have, I think, now something in the order of over 300 uh, uh, ICU beds and over uh, several uh, now, it, just in terms of other beds, bed space and hospital capacity, that is also uh, considerably high today. But uh, we've also, uh, in terms of just improving capacity and improving our ability to respond, just on the medical side alone, uh, you will see that, uh, you know, in, in, at a point, we were worried about um, uh, we were worried about just the capacity to provide oxygen. Now we have uh, several um, uh, facilities for oxygen. Even oxygen production has actually gone up in, 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 in Nigeria. And that means uh, that today we are able to do uh, much more, we, even, with, um, uh, even with our capacities in the hospitals. Uh, we now have about you know, just bed capacity alone, 7,190 beds. We have about 20,000 health workers that have been trained on infection and control. We have over 4,000 now oxygen uh, delivery equipment and accessories nationwide, you know, and we've also uh, uh, been able to provide about a minimum of about a billion naira to each state just to improve their capacity. Lagos State alone had about 10 billion. So just in terms of improving medical capacity, a lot has happened. But then that's on the, uh, on the medical uh, or the healthcare side. On the economic side, obviously you've spoken about the economic sustainability plan, and this has provided again yet another opportunity of addressing some of the uh, serious concerns that we have on the economy. I mean, I think for us as a government, you know, one of the key worries that we had was more for the uh, for how this would affect jobs and job production and and, and job sustenance. And I think that um, what what we saw was a problem, a very big problem, with um, the informal workers, in, you know, and persons who uh, have to work day to day. Uh, for their for their survival, and w w what we tended to see there was that people like you know just to take an example, uh, tailors, uh, artisans, caterers, event planners, decorators, makeup artists, hairdressers, barbers, tailors even for ashrebi, printers, souvenir dealers, people like that, obviously were in trouble, and we needed to address uh, the concerns that they had because these people rely on an ecosystem that had collapsed with uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. And that's aside from big industries such as hospitality. Of course, uh, occupancy rates in hotels fell in some big hotels below 10%. Even, even hospitals, even private hospitals, you know, experience problems because people uh, avoided private hospitals, same as aviation. And of course, we know all the problems associated with that. So we're concerned with saving those jobs, and which is why uh, we put in place uh, what is called, what we've described as a survival fund, uh, which will cater for artisans, 42,000 uh, per state for a start, across the states, and uh, that will be in the form of support for artisans. We also have a payroll support scheme, which will support uh, persons, especially in 
you know, private school teachers, for example, uh, and then small businesses uh, who, who employ uh, up to and not more than about 50 persons. We also have some kind of support for them. At the moment, we're in the process you know, of uh, compiling that data and uh, the criteria have, has been set already. Uh, that committee is headed by uh, the Honourable Minister of State for Industry, Trade and Investment and the Vice Chair uh, is, uh, is um, Mrs. Ibuku Awoshika, the, chair, uh, the chairperson of First Bank. So they are basically looking at the criteria for, for giving out uh, the, the, this payroll support and also for several of the other support schemes that we have. So by and large, you know, we're, we're tackling those issues, of course. We're also looking at the bigger issues. How do we support aviation? How do we support the hospitality industry? And these are big uh, areas where uh, we're, we're looking at support. Now, in the first place, you're probably aware that the CBN uh, has already uh, put in place several mechanisms for uh, ensuring that loans that have been taken by companies and by uh, some of these uh, some of these big enterprises in the sectors that I've just mentioned, that there is some circle for them in the form of restructuring of their loans, lower interest in some cases, uh, in some in some moratorium is granted, and all of that. I just I'm just picking the headlines of of, of some of these uh, efforts, and of course, the Bank of Industry has also had to reduce. Uh, uh, interest rates in many cases and restructure facilities. So there is a wide range of issues. I'm sure we'll get to talk about them in some detail later on. But this is just to give you a broad, uh, if you like, uh, a broad framework of the kinds of efforts that are going on. And this is, of course, yeah. so I, I think I'll just hold on here. Yeah. I don't uh, take on too much time. I'm sure we might come back to this as we go along. In terms of uh, the contraction uh, to GDP, uh, just as you pointed out, uh, several of the comparator countries or the countries that we compare ourselves to have, in terms of contraction, been much worse uh, than 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 we than we have. And so there is a sense uh, there is a sense in which uh, we can feel uh, happy, uh, a bit um, happier with ourselves, I suppose. But uh, again, we mustn't forget that uh, economies like politics is local. It's so you have to concern yourself with your own problems and with your own issues. I mean, well, while it's helpful uh, for us to say, well, in the UK, contraction was uh, minus 20% of GDP in France, minus 14, in Germany, minus 10, in Israel, minus 29, South Africa is even projected to be between 20 and 50 percent. Well, we can say so. And Nigeria is only minus 6 percent. The truth and the reality is what the people feel. Obviously, today, uh, there is uh, a considerable anxiety. Uh, there is uh, there, there, there is a, an economic decline of the sort that affects everyone. It affects services. It affects even lawyers. I mean, lawyers will tell you that they are going through very difficult times, let alone other people in different services and all that. So the truth of the matter is that our contraction of minus 6% is good, is better than others, you know, but it is, still, it is still only part of the story. The real story, of course, is that uh, we are experiencing a severe economic decline. We're experiencing a severe decline in domestic resources, in, in tax, etc. We're experiencing a severe decline in, 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 uh, in employment. So there are many, many job losses. So, so our response to that is, is really what I think uh, uh, is important. And that is, first, we are concerned with saving jobs, and we're concerned with creating other jobs. And the way we've chosen to go about this, and especially as part of the Economic Sustainability Plan, is by ensuring or by insisting in the plan that we will focus on local industry, local production, using local resources. So for example, our mass agricultural program is one that we expect will bring in loads of jobs. We're looking at, in every state, 
uh, bringing between 30 and 100,000 hectares of land under cultivation. And we're bringing in that many new farmers. As a matter of fact, as of today, we've registered over 5 million farmers. And, at, and we have actually attached them to their land. So we have GIS that shows who the farmer is, where his land is. And what we're doing also is that these farmers, these small farmers, are now aggregated under some of our partners who are more like anchors. So we have partners, huge partners like um, uh, like Babangona, like Thriver Greek, uh, like um, uh, like like Thriver Greek, who are big uh, partners like Olam, who already have uh, big farms. Now these big farm uh, owners uh, are people are, are already established, and what they do is that they act as anchors to the small farmers. So to some extent, they guarantee that the small farmers will produce and they will offtake what the small farmers produce. And we have quite a few of these uh, uh, huge farmers who are taking on uh, the smaller farmers. And government then becomes the offtaker of last resort or the purchaser of last resort. So in the event that uh, some of this produce cannot be bought, government will buy. This is just to ensure that production continues, to ensure that the agricultural sector is well resourced. We're also, of course, concerned with losses, with, uh, with, 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 with losses in the cause of, um, especially you know, in, in the value chain, all sorts of you know, severe losses, as you know. Sometimes we lose up to 40% of production in the farms. So we're trying to ameliorate that as well, as we look at the entire value chain. So we're concerned also with, with, with ensuring that the value chain is, is much stronger so that jobs are created all along the line. Agro-production, agro-production is, is a serious part of the work uh, that, we're, that, that we're trying to do. That is for agriculture. Then we have mass housing. This again focuses on local materials. We're looking at about 300,000 housing units, low-cost housing units. And we're thinking, and, we're, and today, we already have a plan, uh, we already have a design that will be able to bring in a small two-bedroom apartment for two million naira, or under two million naira. As a matter of fact, we're looking at between 1.8 million and two million naira. Now, how do we intend to do this? First is by ensuring that as much as possible, we use local materials and local resources. So, uh, doors, uh, uh, nails, uh, window frames, etc. We will source locally. Of course, blocks and all of that will source locally. We have cement, you know, all of those will be sourced locally. Each site would have, uh, as it were, its own uh, system production uh, unit where people are making blocks, those who are making doors, making uh, window frames, etc. We'll provide facilities in, in some cases for the production of some of these things. And our Family Homes Fund, as well as the Ministry of uh, Housing, is actively engaged in doing this. We already have 11 states that have given up uh, land, that have given land for this purpose, and we're looking at getting more land from each of the individual states in order to be able to do this. But I what I want to emphasize is that this is about local production. It is about local resources that the the, the uh, contractors who will be building the land will be small businesses, you know, that are that will register on, uh, you know, online in the different states. So these small businesses, these small uh, building uh, construction companies, not the huge ones, will be the ones who will be taking batches of, of, of houses and build, you know, batches of houses across the country, so that we can actively engage young engineers, young surveyors, you know, young builders, etc who at this point may, may be out of work. Then we have a solar home system as well, a uh, solar home systems project as well. Uh, as you know, uh, with the support of the World Bank, we are putting in, in five million homes, solar home systems in five million homes. Now that means a huge number of jobs. First, you know, in the assembly of the, of, of the home systems locally, before we begin any sort of manufacturing, we don't have that capacity yet. And then in the installation and in the, uh, and in the running of the payment systems for these solar uh, home uh, systems as well. Well, so we, we think that this will also create an immense uh, amount of jobs. 
So really, I, I think that our response uh, to, the, uh, to, to the pandemic uh, is one that uh, I believe is robust. Uh, as you know, we're putting uh, 2.3 million in terms of a stimulus package. And just to understand this 2.3 million, it's not all cash, you know, it's not as if uh, all of that cash is available. About 1.2 trillion of it is in the form of loans and facilities uh, supported by the, uh, by the CBN to be given, for example, for the solar home system project, for the housing project, uh, for the agriculture project as well. These are loans directly to farmers, loans directly to, to, to manufacturers and, and uh, to, pro to provide offtake facilities as well. So here, you know, I think our, our response is robust. We need, we need to move quickly, we need speed. Uh, and um, I think that um, with, with, with what we have in place, uh, we really can respond in the best possible way uh, to this and not uh, think that our circumstances are much better than other countries. As a matter of fact, uh, we are in relatively dire straits and I think that we must respond in that way. Thank you. Just yesterday, the Federal Executive Council approved uh, uh, forensic auditors led by Ernst & Young. Ernst & Young, as you know, is a very, uh, is an international uh, firm of, of auditors. And the, 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 the auditors are led by Ernst & Young. There's a fairly long list of auditors uh, that were recommended by the Auditor General, which as I, I'm sure you know is the law. When you want to audit uh, a federal government enterprise, it is the Auditor General that makes the recommendation uh, of who the auditors will be. Then it goes through the Bureau of Public, uh, of, of public Procurement and all that. But I can tell you today that as of yesterday, a team of auditors led by Ernst & Young uh, will be auditing the NDDC. So that, that I think is the, is the answer to that. Uh, the, 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 the other question that you asked uh, is one that I am not certain what sort of facts you have, but um, if you say that a person is apparently corrupt, I think that uh, concrete allegations have to be made. Uh, those allegations have to, be, uh, have to be investigated. So far, I'm sure you are aware, we've had uh, several individuals within our government who, against whom allegations have been made. Those allegations were investigated, and uh, in many cases, the, uh, those who were accused were suspended while the investigations were going on. And then government resolved the issue one way or the other. I'm sure you're aware of the Secretary to Government of the Federation, the former Secretary to Government of the Federation, the former DG of the NIA, uh, and, some, you know, and, and others such as that. So I don't think that there is any reticence in terms of um, reacting to allegations of corruption. I think that those things, I think those allegations have to be properly investigated. Uh, there has to be fair hearing and uh, steps then have to be taken. So I don't, I, I don't think that uh, our record so far shows any reticence on our part or reluctance on our part uh, to live up uh, to uh, our own, uh, to, to, to live up to our own uh, stated aspirations and stated objectives as a government. Well, um, Duka, let me just say that that uh, question appears to me to be loaded. <laughs> and um, I'm not going to take the bait. Frankly, let me say to you that one learns every day. And I am learning every day, and I pray that God helping us. Uh, by 2023, I would have learned a great deal. But I will not, of course, as you know, uh, there, uh, today I'm completely focused on uh, what it is that we, we are confronted with. We are confronted, as uh, the Honorable, uh, Right Honorable Speaker has said, with possibly the gravest uh, uh, pandemic, uh, the greatest public health crisis of, of our generation, and possibly the greatest economic decline, global economic decline of our generation. So we are challenged by, by, by these uh, very significant issues. And we are, in some senses, privileged. And at the same time, we, 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 we must approach it with a great deal of humility. We are privileged 
to be in service at this time, to be called upon to resolve some of these uh, great issues. So that is where my focus is today, you know. Uh, how I will learn, what I will learn, of course, uh, the coming years uh, will uh, be the only will be the only judge of, of that. Thank you very much. Of importance because of the, in my view, because of the uh, fact that uh, lives are involved. You know, that, uh, I want to say that the mindless, uh, callous killings in Southern Kaduna are heartbreaking. And again, we must condole uh, those who have lost loved ones and those injured or who have suffered loss of property. Now, these tragedies are completely unacceptable and they are avoidable. I've been involved since about 2001 through the work of the Macedonian Initiative, an NGO that focused on relief materials, giving relief materials to displaced persons, you know, since 2001 in Southern Kaduna and several other uh, uh, places, especially in the north central part of Nigeria. Yeah. But the deadly violence in, in southern Kaduna has continued over the years. You know, there have been judicial commissions, etc., you know, all sorts, but the problem remains. So there is a need to address the underlying issues. There's a need to address those. I'll come uh, to that in a moment. But what are we doing? What is the government doing? First, when, uh, is the improvement of security in southern Kaduna. Now we have a military base there for the first time. You know, uh, we now have a military base. We also have a lot of Air Force surveillance. Uh, we have about 500 uh, conventional and mobile policemen in Zagun, Kataf, and Kaura local government. And then the combined military teams from the Army, the Navy, who are also on ground 24 hours. That's basically to just take care of, 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 you know, of uh, the uh, volatile situation there. The president has also had several uh, Security Council meetings, have attended all of those meetings, where the issues have been discussed and you know, the possibilities of engagement have also been discussed. I've also engaged with community leaders in Southern Kaduna and also have engaged with the governor uh, to look at what peacemaking efforts are possible. What, what, what can we do to ensure that this, uh, these killings and this disgraceful, uh, this disgraceful human condition there is dealt with. And, you know, uh, some of the peacemaking efforts have been fairly successful. Recently, uh, I'm sure you've heard of the rapport more between the Zagun Kataf community and the Hausa Fulani community. And we hope that that will develop into something that not only will be permanent, but will be a template for making peace uh, in the future. But I think we, we must address also the fundamental issues. We can't sweep those issues under the carpet. Justice, you know, uh, the, the cries of economic marginalization, the fact that we must prosecute persons responsible for these murders, otherwise the impunity will worsen, and also support to those who have lost their properties and breadwinners. I think uh, some of these issues uh, must also be addressed as we as we go forward. And what have been what we've been trying to do, uh, the president, of course has taken several steps aside from uh, the engagements with uh, the governor and also with the communities there. We're also working, you know, and of course one cannot disclose uh, all of what uh, is going on for uh, reasons of uh, confidentiality and security, but there's also a lot of work going on to ensure that some of these fundamental issues are addressed. And it's an evolving, it's an evolving situation. But uh, it's something we simply cannot afford to ignore. It is, uh, and it's gone on for far too long in my view. And uh, it is redressable, it is possible for us to resolve these issues. That is on the Southern Kaduna issue. The other point you made, uh, the other question you asked was with respect to, the, with respect to Kama, which is the Company and Allied Matters Act. Let me say first that, uh, as you know, the Companies and Allied Matters Act is a very huge legislation has over, 100, uh, over 870 sections or so. So it's a massive legislation that covers a wide range of issues of companies, uh, all sorts of issues on companies, general meetings, appointment of directors, etc. Now there's a small portion of it called the incorporated trustees uh, section. That small section of it is the section that regulates charities. Now churches and mosques and such organizations 
are regarded as charities. So it is the incorporated trustees section of the Companies and Allied Matters Act that has become controversial. And uh, because churches are charities, the provisions in the incorporated trustees act obviously affect uh, the churches. Now what the churches are concerned about is a provision that says, or you know, I think there are about two or three provisions, but the main one is the one that says that in the event that uh, some wrongdoing is found in the uh, uh, some wrongdoing is found by or perpetrated by the trustees of the particular organization or church, the uh, registrar general can go to court, get an order. To, uh, to appoint interim uh, administrators or interim trustees for, uh, for, for the church or for whichever organization, whichever charity that may be, and then, as it were, manage the affairs of such a trust. Now, the concern of the churches is that it could lead to a situation where uh, practically anybody could be appointed as a trustee to oversee a church, and a church obviously, uh, or, or a mosque, or a religious organization, is obviously a spiritual, is obviously a spiritual organization. And if you are not, uh, if you do not belong, if you don't share that faith, or you simply do not even have any faith at all, you may be the wrong person, and the wrong person may be appointed and create more trouble than was initially, uh, 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 than was initially uh, the matter before the trustees were appointed. Now, my view, uh, what, 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 what I have also suggested uh, to uh, several of the groups that I've spoken to and the leaderships that I've spoken to, is that we have uh, a process by which this can be redressed. The, the, uh, the, on, the right honorable speaker of the, uh, of the, uh, of the uh, assembly is here. Uh, the, the right honorable speaker of the House of, of Representatives is here. We have the president of the Senate, and we also have the president. What can be done is that whatever the proposals for amendment may be, whatever the views of the, of, of the church leadership may be regarding the question of how uh, the uh, trustees and the, where there are interim trustees or whatever can be managed, that should be put into proposals that can be brought before the National Assembly before the National Assembly leadership for a consideration of amendments to, uh, to the law. That is a process which, which is entirely open, and I believe that that's a process that ought to be pursued. Where citizens or groups have concerns, where they have serious concerns, we are in a democracy. There is a process by which this can be done, and that process is one where we bring forward amendments to the, uh, to the, uh, to the National Assembly. And the National Assembly, I'm sure, will, 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 uh, will do whatever is considered needful in the circumstances. So this, so this is my position. I, I think that, um, uh, yes, uh, the controversy is, is, is one that has generated a lot of fervor, but uh, the solution to me seems also to be quite evident. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Vice President. We just have about two or three minutes. But just to dig deeper, yes, yeah, an amendment can be made. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, first, let me say that um, as, a, as a general position, I do not think uh, it is right to say that pastors do not want to be accountable. As a matter of fact, as you know, I'm a pastor. So I, I know that that question is also partly directed to me. But I must say that that is not, that, that that is not uh, the case. I believe that several... Uh, uh, several Christian organizations and pastors are willing to be accountable. Uh, but I think that the, quest the problems that they may have are uh, with ensuring that um, processes are not abused in such a way as to compromise uh, the entire organization. And I think that um, if all that is required is uh, some process of accountability, I think it would be easier uh, to, for, for, for organizations to accept that. But where uh, there might be a takeover of the management of the organization, I think that they may, uh, I think the fears, there may, there may be fears as to whether such could be abused. 
And really what needs to be done then is to put in place checks and balances to ensure that there is no abuse in the event uh, that such provisions are activated in any way or even to modify those provisions uh, to allay everybody's fears. But I, do, I don't think that is a matter of uh, pastors being uh, fearful of accountability. I think that uh, all of us are subject to law and uh, we must accept that uh, the laws of Nigeria govern all of us, and uh, we have no choice uh, but to submit to those laws. But fortunately, we're in a democracy, so that we can also advance our own views and opinions, even after the law has been passed uh, for possible amendments. So where, uh, where do I see Nigeria uh, in, in, in the next uh, five years? I must say that um, we've seen all of the challenges we know that in the next uh, five years, our population is going to increase. The number of young people looking for jobs will increase. Uh, there will be greater pressure on our resources. But I also strongly believe that we are in the best possible time in our history. We're in the best possible time in terms of the opportunities that are available. And we must make those opportunities available. First, as government, it is our role, and I think the government's role, is particularly important. As government, it is our role to create the enabling environment for business to thrive and to prosper. And that means ensuring that we remove whatever the hindrances are to doing business in Nigeria. Some of those, uh, so some of those encumbrances, in, uh, for instance, tax. We've done quite a bit with tax. If, you, if your turnover is less than 25 million uh, a year as a company, it's a zero tax uh, policy. If you are between 25 million and, and uh, 100 million, uh, you are paying 20% tax, 10% less than it was before. So we need to clean up the tax environment. We need to ensure that people, multiple taxation does not occur. For example, just here in Abuja, I know that uh, the, the Minister of the Federal Capital Territory has been working very hard, you know, alongside all, all of us, in ensuring that those who do business here are not exposed to multiple taxation and all sorts of other hindrances that are put in people's way. We've been working with the uh, with the uh, with the uh, with NAFTA. NAFTA is an organisation that registers products, but sometimes it takes too long to register a product. So I want to put my product on the market, you know, because obviously several people all over the country are bringing forward their products. It can take forever and a day to be able to register a product. Now, if I don't register my product, I can't sell my product in the supermarkets. So products that are coming in from Ghana, products coming in from elsewhere in the, in, in the world that have already been registered in their own countries are on our shelves in our supermarkets where our own manufacturers are having difficulties. So we're tackling this uh, with, with NAFTA. Obviously, they have their constraints, and we're trying to resolve those constraints as we go forward. So we want to be a manufacturing hub for the rest of Africa. We've signed on to the AFCTA, the, the, uh, the, the, the free trade agreements. We've signed on to that. So we want to be the hub. And we can be the hub of manufacturing. We can be the hub of agriculture. We have the men, we have the resources, we have the land. So that, 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 that is one. We can also be the technology hub of, 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 of Africa, and indeed for many parts of the world. Microsoft has already announced that it will be setting up its, its facility here, its Africa facility here. Several countries are interested in, 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 in technology and the potential. Now, on our part as a government, we're also working hard to ensure that we do not overregulate that space. So fintech companies, for instance, we're ensuring that the central bank doesn't overregulate them allows them to perform, allows them you know, to, uh, uh, to, to, to blossom. And the same thing we're trying to do with the creation of hubs, with the support for, uh, for technology. Recent, just about a couple of weeks ago, the Ministry of Youth and Sports got a 75 billion youth fund. Now that youth fund, a, a substantial amount of it will be devoted to technology. We believe that we can be the technology hub of Nigeria. Frankly, I am convinced that we have everything it takes to be the kind of country that we all dream of. But we have our constraints, and we're Nigerians. We know what our constraints are. Petty corruption, grand corruption, 
everybody is standing in the way, trying to put a toll gate in your way to prevent or to, to take something off you before you're able to, to, to do anything. But we can resolve those issues. With, greater, with more technology, it can become easier for us to get passports using technology, and which is what we're investing in. We're investing a great deal more in technology so that there is no human interference in doing a lot of what you want to do. So you don't pay, you don't have to go out and see someone before you can get a passport. You don't see someone before you can get a license or any kinds of approvals. The more technology we introduce, the easier it is for people to do their business without the obstacles uh, that, are, that, are, that are all over the place. And, and, and finally, I think that one of the critical problems, one of the critical issues for us is infrastructure. This government has devoted tremendous resources to infrastructure. The railway, for example, was the railway from Lagos to Kano, starting from their papa port, in order to be able to clear their papa port so that we can move goods out, out of Lagos. Which, and the busiest port is Lagos. The roads, the Lagos Ibadan Expressway, etc., and several other roads, you know, uh, Abuja, Kaduna, so many of the uh, different Abuja, Kano, and so many of the different uh, road networks across the country. We've, we've been lucky that we've had the um, National Assembly supporting in ensuring that this infrastructure is built. We need infrastructure, we need to build infrastructure, but we need to fund infrastructure also, and we don't have the resources. Which is why we're doing so many different things. Of course, we're lending money and we're putting our money in infrastructure. If, we lend, if you lend money, if you put it in infrastructure, that is profitable because it means that your business environment is improved. So I see a great Nigeria. I think that we have more than the potential to be, to go where we please. And we mustn't, we mustn't in any way allow people to talk this country down. You know, we can't, we can't allow that. Because if we do, this will be the biggest. This will be the biggest drawback for us. So I believe very strongly that our country uh, can be great and will be great. And I see that in the next five years, despite the challenges we see today, the future is certainly very, very bright. Thank you.